What's insane is the amount of money you produced your first month in the business. <laughs> we don't want to talk about money. Well, <laughs> people, people want to hear about want to hear about it. How much did you write your first month? Fifty over fifty thousand dollars in annual premium volume. First month in the insurance industry. Why people fail in the insurance business is the same reason why people fail in network marketing. It's the same reason they fail in any type of sales. It's too the barrier of entry is far too low. I can buy $500 of leads, and if I don't make it, I can go right back to doing what I was doing. I wouldn't be here today, Cody, if I didn't put myself in a situation where I couldn't afford to fail. Mm. I've already, I invested too much into this already to not learn how to do it successfully. And I wasn't successful right off the bat, but I think there's such a low barrier of entry these days in any opportunity, it's so easy to quit. Right, you're gonna, you're gonna hate me if I say this, but like I could tie a note around a dog's net if it was cute and send it into 10 people's home and he'll come back with three policies just because the people want it. <laughs> like, it, it's just, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm serious, right? So if you don't offend the person, there's three out of 10 that want a policy. Oh. And see, 92% of the people, 92% of the people won't watch it till the end. That's exactly right too. But the 8% who do, may learn something. You are listening to the 8% Nation podcast, created to help you become a top producer in the insurance industry. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the next episode of 8% Nation podcast, Cody. We have our friend and guest, Nate Offert here, dude. How did you get this guy to the office all the way from Dallas? Well, I know I had to put on my sweater today because he set the... Cool, it's 65 degrees in here. Dude. Someone turned it up because it's not 65. Dude. I had to, dude, I've been begging him to come for months, man. You got these, you know? you got these lights on. I feel like a McDonald's hamburger, he like sitting, finally under, showed sitting up. underneath the, the eating Four lamp. Four cameras. Oh my dude, goodness. you're in the hot seat, man. I, I'm definitely in the hot How's seat, that that's for sure. Feel? What's that? How's that make you feel? Being in the hot seat? Hot. <laughs> Dude, you are a sushi ordering extraordinaire, dude. You That's you worked true. me, you worked that sushi menu better than anyone I've ever seen last night, dude. That's because I worked in a sushi restaurant, man. Wow. I was a, I was a waiter. Did I you waited, really? Yeah, I waited tables what for. Age? Let's see, I was probably I was in my twenties. Um, <clears throat> actually, late twenties. There was a point in my career where I started in a business and and had was able to meet a mentor, have some credible success, and then um, that company had gone out of business. So you know, the only thing else I knew was waiting tables. So I went back and uh, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Wow. Sushi in the raw, it was called. Nice. Yeah. Well, he showed me around, man. I thought I knew sushi, but this guy was like ordering everything, man. Dude, he, he, uh, he already, freaked you out. You, got, you were looking away at some time whenever you were eating <laughs> <some> <laughs> of this sushi. You know, and all kind of crazy stuff. I'm like, I'm over here with my, 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 my crazy. I thought, dude, no, that was good. It was really dude, good. I'm in my fried spicy sushi roll, and you guys are like, right. Getting crazy. Eating He's like, that's really an octopus right there. Dude, the, the way he drives cars. Well, it, the way it, he orders two hundred dollars, is two hundred dollars bottles orders. of wine, you know, just just knocking on the list, just baller over here. Dude, just because well, you were in town, you rubbed off on me. <laughs> that's a good segue. So, you know, why, why don't we talk a little bit? We don't need to go too far in depth because we'll do influencers later. But let's let's hear a little bit about your story, man. Where'd you start? You know, you're obviously insurance extraordinaire, recruiter extraordinaire. But but where's Nate Offer begin? The, the extraordinaire part, I'm not quite sure about what that. What you are though, deep down, everyone's got an innate gift. Mm-hmm. Right, his is his is his is marketing, talking marketing, simplifying marketing. Yours is yours is building people up, promoting them, making them feel like a million bucks as he's doing right Good. now. That's Thanks, right. That, that's his gift. He Thanks, has that buddy. gift. He has that gift. You're a promoter, accomplishing a lot, being humble. That's his <laughs> gift. You, thank See, you. The mate. problem is, is like we, I have like one gift, and you have like ten. Like how do how do we even <laughs> compete? Right? He's a marketer extraordinaire. Oh, you gave me two. I got two. What was I? I was a recruiting extraordinaire and, and sushi else? expert. So, oh, I got two gifts. Done. Okay, good. Two. Done. Two is better than one. Sure. You're better. You're I only just, got one. Really, you're better than just marketing extraordinary. Yeah. Have you always I been play a basketball? Extraordinary like, father. I noticed that. That's true. No, dude, kids, yeah, he's, he he's, yeah, he's dancing with his little girl. Like he's extraordinarily really cool. He's really extraordinarily cool, tall. If you stood up, would, that's would, true. So if he stood up, would, like, hit with his head go above the camera of the pocket. Oh, I'd go way above the camera. <laughs> like seven, yeah. seven foot giant over here. Have you always been a promoter? No, you know what's funny is, and, and it's kind of like um, <laughs> this before and after photos. I. I don't recognize who I used to be at this point in my life, and it wasn't because of what I accomplished. It was about, it was about people who came in my life who helped me. I, I was very um, insecure, mm. you know, very, very insecure. Um, I grew up where I had, uh, it was a family of, of six, and my dad went to work. My mom stayed home with the kids. My dad, it, oh, he made $36,000 a year raising a family of six. Like, I don't even know how, even back then, it's like I don't know how that was even possible, you know, as like uh 
hand me hand me downs are kind of not an option since both my older siblings were sisters. <laughs> so, <laughs> or that could explain a lot. I'm not sure one of the two, okay, right? Okay, <laughs> all right. But you know, we'd go yard sailing. You know, my mom my mom would wake up, my sister would wake up, and they would circle the ads, and we'd go from one yard, and I could, wasn't left at home, so that, that's why I don't really like shopping. <clears throat> I was shopped out. Three yeah. sisters, they drug me to, the, to the, the yard sales. I like buying, but I don't like shopping. People are like, oh, let's just go look around. No, no, I, if I want to go buy something, I'll go, but I don't want to just go look around. I'm with you. Yeah. I spent a lot of time looking around. So we would just basically go on a Saturday morning and dig around other people's junk and trash that they're discarding for a quarter and a dollar. So <clears throat> I'd go to my friend's house, and we'd, they'd have the um, Nintendo. You remember those? Uh, you guys are young. Yeah, I don't know no. if you remember the Nintendo. Like, you probably think those are ancient, right? No, like, no, no. Nintendo was my... Mar- Mario Brothers came out, and they had the, the little baseball game with the Ouija running around and stuff, you know, and I had the... Bing, bing, Pong. Bing. Yeah, I had the Atari. Oh, no, seriously. Yeah, like, we bought the Atari when they were all done two, three years later. They discarded Dang. stuff. You are old. And so we'd have the Atari... Oh, I know. I had my first computer was a Commodore 64, so with the floppy disk. <laughs> Most of if you guys are young, young people follow your podcast, they're probably like, who's What are you guy? talking who's about? Ancient <laughs> grandpa dude talking about so, Commodore, Uncle Nate. Commodore 64. So, let's fast well, forward. Before, you know, Al Gore helped invent the internet, you know, we, we didn't have it back then. <laughs> so, oh, we're not supposed to talk about politics. Sorry. Maybe, you know, they're giving me rules here, guys. I'm just not a rule follower. So, uh, this is, dude, yeah, this is that, your show, that, man. That, that, you're, whatever you're, you want. You're the, you're the star. <laughs> you're the guest, man. Uh, you you know? guys are funny. So I, I grew up, um, my, my sisters were extremely smart. Uh, we went to private school because my dad worked at a mission board, so uh, Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. So his office was here, and here was the Bethel Baptist Christian School was here. So whenever I got in trouble, they just like walked me across this, I'll never forget, it's like this lane of trees and right to my dad's office, which was never a good day. Um, but when I got to high school and see like, my sisters were like the 4.0, Magnum, Shima, Lada, Kum, you know, dun, dun, Val Victorian, whatever, and here comes me. Uh, and so I played sports and, um, I was good enough at a small school to, to, you know, play soccer and basketball at at the higher level and stuff. And, uh, you know, it was kind of that whole thing where I'm not mad at you, Nancy and Cheryl, if you're watching this, but you know, it's like, oh, there's this the goody goody cause they were good, you know, goody goody girls getting good grades and here comes their little brother. So Mm. I, I was, I was picked on a lot back then. Hazing was legal, you know, so getting stuffed in lockers and. Yeah. <laughs> at lunch where they pull your, you know, what they call the wedgie, right? Where they pulled you know, swirlies. You know, had to stop wearing, yeah, swirlies. Had to stop wearing underwear. You guys still did that too? And now it's illegal, right? You go to jail if you hazing. Yeah, no more hazing. Home. Yeah, so. That's true. Yeah, so I, when I was in college, dropped out of college, second time, I was very insecure. I was I just, I uh, wanted to be a people pleaser. I was insecure about it. I didn't have a lot of confidence um, in terms of being successful at anything. I got kicked out of college twice, so. Yeah. What'd you kick out for? Uh, you know, it's confidential. <laughs> if it wasn't confidential, what would you say? <laughs> Hypothet- hypothetically, <laughs> if I had to tell you, but since I don't, I won't. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. It was nothing bad. You know, I went to a Christian school. We were goofing off. Uh, uh, you know, they had demerits and they had, t- like, uh, it was almost like prison, but <laughs> it was a school where, you know, you had, um, what do you call it, curfew? The good thing is no one will see this. Like, what we're doing is totally confidential yeah. right Oh, now. yeah. No is that, that why no four cam- this is just a conversation with us three. I'm thinking about, like, the dean of the school, like, thinking, okay, wait, we'll tell you exactly right in the comments. We'll tell you where you got kicked out for. <laughs> I got too many demerits one semester because, <clears throat> you know, they had a quiet hours. Yeah. You know, where people's phones were supposed to be shut off and stuff. Sorry. Nope. Right. <laughs> I am sorry. They, they had quiet hours. <laughs> we couldn't make noise, and we'd be up in the you know, rafters and with those bullhorns. Called the wildebeest. Just, just goofing off, just doing goofy stuff. That was in college? <clears throat> yep. Yeah. So, that was in so, college. So transitioning to you, who was mid to late 20s Nate? Because I know you were really trying to get this success thing off the ground. Before insurance, like you've been, you've been in insurance for how long now? Oh wow, just finished up six years. Which I think will give a lot of people hope, honestly, because you are where you have gone in six. And it's because of your past. It really is, and they, they don't know that yet. I know, right? But and I learned a lot at your SWAT event. But I know that where you've went in six years in this industry is naturally unheard of. Well, I always say I'm a twenty year overnight success. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people that are getting started, like you, you. <laughs> If you're like walk into a city, my mentor used to always talk about this, right? You walk into a city and if you go to, we lived in New Jersey, right? You go to New York City or you go to a big city and you see them building buildings, right? They, all you ever see is these, you know, they have these wood planks on the sidewalk 
right? They had this fence up there where you can't really see in, except for the wind is torn a little piece of it, right? You know, mm -hmm. and, and you can't see anything, but you hear a lot banging and you hear construction and you hear this. And it seems like for months and months or years and you don't see anything happening. And all of a sudden, you know, if you're driving down that same way or taking a taxi down the same way or you're walking down that same way, it seems like overnight this sky, skyscraper goes up yeah. where it's like 100 stories. And because 90% of the, the work is in the foundation, right? So a lot of people see the success and they think, you know, whoever it is, like you see it all the time and it's, it's, it, it, it gets depressing because mm -hmm. you're like, I'm doing the right things and I'm doing it. And, and you are, you're building a foundation, you're doing the right things and, and the building will whoosh, get up there, right? And so I see so many people that they don't spend enough, they don't enjoy that time or, or they don't spend enough time. And my mentor was teaching me that in, in the very early on saying that you can't judge your results on a daily basis you can't judge them on a weekly basis, a monthly basis. You're building your foundation. He said, Nate, if you're going to build a house, mm. do you want to build a foundation on a strong foundation? I mean, the Bible talks about it, one of the greatest success books out there. Yeah. You know, whether you believe in God or not, you know, build your foundation upon the rock as opposed upon the sand. sand. Jesus, whatever you think of him, said, do it. That's, to me, that's the first greatest success book ever written. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these success books that you see, most of them are based on the Bible. Oh, yeah. You do unto others, and you had to do unto you. Oh, how to win friends, influence people. You know, I'm like, hello. Right? I mean, you go on and on. And I went to, you went to a Bible college. I went to a Bible college. So most people don't know I have a minor in theology. Well, I didn't actually get the minor because I dropped out two years before <laughs> I got it. But, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school, Wednesday prayer meeting, Awana, you know, hail Awana on the march for youth. You'd have Awana. No, I didn't get. I didn't have a wanna in the Baptist church. Okay, some of you guys may know what wanna. I know so what it is, but I didn't had the get Timothy it. Award, meritorious award. But <clears throat> what what I realized is that you know he said, do you want to build this building, and you know whether it be your home, or whatever it is, and you get there, and you know you're you're picking out the furniture, and you finally have this beautiful home, and you're putting the, the window dressings on, and you're picking out you know your bed, and all of a sudden a, a wind comes through, and the and the building crumbles because you build it on a weak foundation. Mm. And so many people I see, they're such in a hurry that they build on a weak foundation. And then, of course, whose fault? Oh, it's the company's fault. It was the leadership fault. It was whatever in the insurance. It's the leads' fault. It's the leads. And they build it on a weak foundation. And so, like to me, he he, and that was me. I, I was I kept trying to build on weak foundations, build on weak foundations, build on weak foundations. And I went through a lot where I had success and lost it. I had success and lost it. And I and and, and finally, I was just he was able to pull me aside and go, Nate, just quit trying to, and he drew, <laughs> I wish I could draw some, he drew a staircase like this, right? So imagine if you had a staircase I was drawing and he had it right here on the top. And he said, this is success. And he, he, he said, here's most of the people, including you. You run up here, you see it, right? And you take this running start and you, ah, boom, and you smash your head on the third or fourth step. So you're like, I know what I need to do. I need to run harder. I need to get a faster run. I need to get a, maybe I can put a trampoline right down. And it's like, just run, 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 boom. He's like, just, I mean, it sounds so dumb, right? It sounds so dumb and so like childish, but it's like just one step at a time, one step at a time. So <clears throat> the success I'm having now with the company I'm working with is 20 years of walking from step to step to step, some step, right? Yeah. So there, there's people that are, are doing better than me that didn't have the 20 years, right? So I don't, I don't, I, I consider myself to be, I mean, there's people in our company uh, or in this industry who, you know, six years ago were bartenders and now they're sitting there running a, an agency doing a million dollars a month Yeah. Or, or they were, you know, whatever. Right. And, and, I, and again, I was always taught to run your own race. Right. It, it's, it's like the whole tortoise and the hare thing. It's like, you got to run your own race because, you know, you want to learn from those people, but like everyone's journey is going to be different and you got to be willing to run your own race. And I, fell victim to a lot of people that fall victim to now where and I still catch myself doing it because it's hard not to, right? But you'll see these people having a trend of success and you want to be there and you want to be there so fast that you don't you don't look and just go, okay, this is my own race. This is my own journey. It's easy to get frustrated too when you see that and you're like, dang, I want to be there. I, right. I feel like I deserve to be there, you know, and you're not. And he taught me something I'll never forget. He said, <clears throat> measure your life or your success based upon where you are today and where you were yesterday and the week before and the month before. And if you're only focused on that, then it's amazing how you don't get distracted on whatever else is going around you. Because mm. I look back now, am I where I want to be? Absolutely not. Am I close to where I think my potential is? No way. No. But I can look at where I was five years ago and I'm not the same person. Yeah. 
I look at where I was 10 years ago and I want to punch that guy in the face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I can look where I was 20 years ago and, and I, I'm not even a shadow of who I was. You know, so it's just about that, you know, building that foundation um, to be able to, when that, once that foundation is built and it's built on the rock, right, and it's yeah. built strong, then, you know, it can go into pretty much any area of your life. You can have that success, so. You, you did network marketing before insurance? I did, yeah. yeah. Talk us through that, man, because I think that's, um, that's an industry that, you know, some, some people love, some people hate, some people think it's silly, you know, but it, I think it, there's one thing that I know is, is that people that come from that background, uh, they are really good at promoting, selling, getting to know people, building an organization, recruiting, a lot of things that actually transition really well to insurance. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you're, build, you're building sales teams, you're dealing with people. I mean, people are people are people, no matter what it is that you're trying to sell them or recruit them into an opportunity. It, it's yeah. the same, the mind's the same, right? 95% of the decisions that are made in the mind are done in the subconscious mind versus the conscious mind, yeah. right? But most people talk to, communicate to, market to that logical part of the brain and they wonder why they're not having success. And so when my mentor came in my life, he completely you know, rearranged you know, my structuring and how I thought to understand, you know, about like we talk about facts tell stories sell, right? And people are like, oh, that's really trite. That's really great. No, that that's what billion dollar companies do. They market in stories. That's right. You know, you're at the SWAT training. And I did that funny little thing for about an hour. I mean, but was that not crazy? Yep, it really I mean, was. It was crazy. Like you know, and, and we can't get away. Come to the SWAT training. Sometimes you'll see it. But I mean, it was an hour long thing where if you don't leave there going, holy cow, right? You know. You literally, these billion dollars companies market to that subconscious part of the brain through stories, which makes you make a decision without you even knowing you're making that decision. You know. <clears throat> well, and, and, and on that note, the greatest speakers in the world mm -hmm. start with a story, end with a story. Right. So when I'm in a home, you know, so whether you're talking about network marketing, right? And I mean, see, network marketing has changed a lot. So I don't even know what network marketing is today because yeah. we did it without the internet. Right, and wow. I think like in its infancy, you know, when Amway started, you know, they would the, the guys were off at war, and the women wanted to stay home, and they'd go start selling soap and cleaning products and everything else, and it was Amway, which stood for the American way, right? That's what the there was a rally, there was a cause behind it. There was I didn't a, know that. Yeah, there was a cause behind that where you know that's what, it, and it then developed into this you know multi-billion dollar global. Did conglomerate. you know that? Oh, my my parents did Amway. They weren't okay. very successful. I didn't but, know that right. though. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of, you know, it's the American way. And so the, the, the original, and I'm not a network marketing expert, so if any network marketers are watching this and you're going, that's not, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. This is just what I've been told. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? I didn't start Amway. I'm not on the board of directors. I don't know how they started Everything it. Everything he says today is 100% accurate. You can fact check it all. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, fact good. fact check it, I guess. But traditionally, am, uh, uh, network marketing was nothing more, and it's evolved into something completely different, right? Good, bad, or ugly. Um, and it, it was cutting out the middleman. Right? You had a manufacturer that had a national distributor, had a regional distributor, had a local distributor, and then you had a customer. And every time that touched the hands of the national distributor, the regional distributor, to the local distributor, to the customer, everyone made money on that. And 80% of the profit was tied up in what's called the middleman's markup. So traditionally what network marketing was is what if you could cut out that middleman and take the product or service directly from the manufacturer to the consumer and the people who did that shared within the profits. That's all it was. And I don't know how anyone can say that's a bad idea. Yeah. It's not a bad idea, right? So there were bad companies, just like anything else, that came in and just, you know, they didn't really care about the product. They just wanted to recruit people to get involved. Right. Right. Um, you know, or they just wanted to pay people for recruiting and different things in that nature. So, and then there was great companies, like, you know, like some of the ones you hear of that are still around today, who did it the right way. You know, so when I was back in network marketing, it was we bought and purchased products at a discounted rate. We got wholesale products and we were able to, to distribute to them for to people at a, at a retail cost or a letter of credit, and we were able to make that middleman's profit. So, you know, here I am in my 20s, and I show up to this meeting, right? So, and and uh, <clears throat> I just got kicked out of college twice. My buddy came back all excited, you know, if you ever got recruited for network marketing, you know, they're like, oh my God, I found this company, and they puke all over you and stuff. And I was young, and I even said, okay, I'll come. I walk in this room, everyone's happy, and they're all joy, you know, greeting you, and hey, come on, sit down, good to meet you, I heard so much about you, and I'm like, oh, this is different, which they're really good, you know, it, energy. Just energy, exciting, I was never in a room full of people that were so excited and so much energy and so positive, and mm -hmm. that's attractive. That's one of the most no attractive doubt. things about network marketing, you know, and, and that's, besides the product and the compensation plan and everything else, I mean, just being around that environment does something to you, 
right? I agree. And so they stuck me in the middle seat so I couldn't get out because then I look up here and you see all these products and you're like, I see a water filter and an air filter and I just got finished having a cigarette because I used to smoke back then and you know, and I'm like, oh God, water filter, air filtration, nutritional products. And this company was light years ahead of like, my, this is where I met my mentor. He was the one that ran a company. He had a, he was such a visionary. He had this vision that was light. He was one day, this is back when like you guys, I guess hard to talk to you guys when you're so young, you're probably like three. Like there was a day when you walked in the supermarket, there was not bottled water on the shelves. I believe it or not, there was no bottled water. There was a distilled water for your mom's iron because back then in an iron, they couldn't use the regular tap water because it would ruin the iron. So they had like distilled water that they'd put in there so they could steam the clothes. That was all that was there. And he already first said one day they're going to be selling water, right? Mm -hmm. This bottle, and you are going to pay more for this bottle of water than you do a gallon of gas. People are like, whatever. Happened, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Bottle of Avion, four bucks, three bucks, two. You go to the airport, it's like you know four ninety nine for a bottle of water. Yep. You're not paying that for gas. It's not a gallon. What's it? Five hundred milliliters, sixteen fluid ounces. You're paying. And so you had a water filtration that you'd hook up on the on the person's uh, sink and. You do a little pool test kit. So you took a chlorine tester from a pool and you'd walk in there and you'd take water from, um, you know, they'd water from their, their tap water. And then it would show right here, it's like how much chlorine is your pool because it was so condensed and there's so much, because there's all so much crap in the tap water, right? You know, it's like trihalomethanes and chlorine. And I mean, you know, you know, water gets recycled. You know, we bathroom, water recycled, right? Scary, right? And so when you first turn that faucet on, man, it's just like, you know, Take the water, they test kit it, and you'd pull it up there, and it actually had more chlorine in the tap water than should be in your pool to safely swim in. Wow. And you'd screw this little knob on there, and you push a little button, and do it, take it, zero chlorine. Filtered all the stuff. So it was like, okay, great, I can buy that thing for 120 bucks, I can sell it for $200, and I just made, what is that, $80 profit? Yeah. 80 bucks. So we just go and talk. So the, there was a legitimate product, right? We yeah. had a product that we could demonstrate, that we yeah. could show to people, and we could talk about, you know, environmentally safe cleaning products and everything else. So I, I, a lot of things have changed since then, but ours was nothing. And that's what's funny when people, I, I hear people said they failed, you know, and they bl they blame my mentor, they blame people. I mean, like, okay, I get you failed, but like, how is it? You know, oh, it's a pyramid scheme, okay. Um, most companies I know, there's a, a president. The vice president, regional directors, local managers, and employees on the bottom. And last time I checked, there's more employees than presidents. Yeah. So that takes the shape of a pyramid. Mm -hmm. I went to church, and I never showed up, and there was 400 pastors, and I was the only one in the congregation, because that'd be weird. That'd there be was weird. a pastor, <laughs> and there was deacons, yep. and then there was a Treasury congregation and, yep, yep. in the shape of a... Pyramid. Triangle. Circle. Triangle. Yes. <laughs> Cylinder. Right? And, and, and then you look at our government, and there's a president, and there's a vice president, and there's the House, the Congress, Senate, whatever order that goes is that, in. Is that where you get so good at sales? Taxpayers? Is that where you get so good at but sales? Wait, my point is, right, right, so, like, okay, it's a pyramid. Okay, yeah. yes, what's not? So if I got involved, and it's the same thing with it's anything else, right? Leads for insurance. The network. Yeah, it is where I got good in sales. I'll, I'll bring that up, but... If I got involved and I could buy a product wholesale and I could distribute it at a higher cost of retail and I fail, like it wasn't, I, I didn't cost to sign up. I could just get signed up and, and, and talk about the company or bring people to the events and everything else. I made a choice to buy products and I sell products for a higher profit. And if I recruited people to do the same thing, they took a total of the amount of sales that you did each month and they paid you a bonus by helping train them how to buy products wholesale and sell them retail. Now, if you're an idiot and go out and buy $30,000 of products so you can get a pin on put on your chest, and you can go out there and go, look, I'm a director my first month or whatever it is, and you don't sell your stuff. You're broke. You're broke. Now, is that because you're part of a pyramid deal or is it because you're an idiot? Yeah, you're working the system, not how it was intended. How it was intended. Yeah. So there was a lot of idiots that get involved in network marketing. Mm -hmm. Sorry to tell you. They want that recognition. They get, they, get, they get addicted to that recognition because when you're in that network marketing, you get that celebrity status because you're on stage or you got went director. They didn't want to spend the time building the foundation. Yeah. So it doesn't matter, right? So to me, I think it's silly. Like, and, and there's people that blame my mentor, or blame a company that, you know, whatever, whatever company in there, blame all oh, a part of a pyramid deal. That guy was a, 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 a conniver or a manipulator. Oh yeah, you know, cleaning up the environment, you know, making your water healthier, giving you nutritional products, you know, trying to help you live a, a successful life and be an entrepreneur and help other people. I mean, that what an awful dude, horrible guy. Can't believe him, man. He should be put in jail. Yeah. 
you know, so network marketing, you know, it's, it, it's from the outside looking in, it's easy to say those things about it. Yep. But from the inside looking out, unless you're an idiot, you're having a product or a service you're able to bring to people in a manner and in a way that you can cut out the middleman and you can share amongst the profits. So right? that, now, that, there are people that abuse it. Yeah. So those fundamentals really carried you into the insurance industry and you just kind of hit dovetailed right in and just crushed it is what I'm hearing and understanding. Well, I went from training to training. So this company I was in, it had trainings each weekend and I would go to a training and I'd go to training and training and I'd be surround myself with people who were having this success. Right. And so that's where my personal growth came from. And it was like almost like forced personal growth. You know, when people talk about personal growth, it is readers are leaders. You got to have personal growth. So I was going, I was traveling to a weekend training. I'd spend two days in a train learning things I was never taught. I, I, my first training, I flew out to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And my mentor was doing a training in the MGM Grand Theater. And there was, you know, 13,000 people that showed up and, and they paid a thousand to three thousand dollars a piece to hear him speak for three days. I'll never forget because I'm standing there. I'm, I'm brand new, you know, and, and <clears throat> I had to go here too because this all plays in the fact, you know, okay. I mean, we could probably put this on a podcast on network marketing. They'd probably love me. They would. Right. But, and it's not about pushing or, or d d saying good things or bad things about, but, but no. it, it, it all comes down to the, to, to the same, the same principles, right? Why people fail in the insurance business is the same reason why people fail in network marketing. It's the same reason they fail in any type of sales. It's too, the barrier of entry is far too low. I can buy $500 of leads, and if I don't make it, I can go right back to doing what I was doing. I yeah. mean, we've all wasted 500 bucks on something, right? Yeah. A weekend you can't remember when you were younger, you know, a, a, a trip that turned out to be a bad trip. Um, sushi dinner last night. Sushi dinner, yeah, sushi dinner last We only had, I only lost 250 on that. We got to split it. Yeah, that's true. So, but, so, so like, when I was in that business, because I said, okay, what are the successful people doing? Back then, it was like, you know, I bought products to sell. I got involved and they had a, a training center and I was, I want to be part of the training center where everyone shared in, in desk rent. So I bought $600 a desk rent for a month. Back then you had to hook up a phone and that phone was like $185 to hook up. And then it was eight cents. I know this is crazy. Eight cents, every call in and out. So think about it. you're making call. So guess what that taught me though? Every call matters. matters. Every call matters. So it's ingrained in my head. Every call matters, man. I'm paying for this call. Eight cents, right? So, I mean, you walk in there and you had to run ads to recruit. Well, an ad back then, you couldn't post an ad on Facebook. There wasn't even, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet, <laughs> right? So, you couldn't buy, so so it was like, okay, it was, you know, 25, depending what area, if you lived in a big city like Dallas, it was probably $50 a line, you know, this many words, right? The classified ads. I'm, I'm really dating myself here. You get most of you guys. No here. doubt. This guy, man, did he have an abacus, man? Did he go to school where they like wrote on a, on a chalk. Chalk, chalk and a slate? But this is what it used to be like. So it was like $50 a line or $25 a line. Oh, but if you wanted to get noticed and stand out in the classified, you got to have four lines high, four bold. So to write a title was 200 bucks. Help needed. I mean, it was two words. 10K a month. You know, you can't write like live your dream. You couldn't put like, it was just like a two word or three word line title. You can put a video high. in there. No videos There's in the no newspaper. There's no video in the newspaper. Okay. And then you had to have, write a body of an ad with your phone number. Right. And so that was a... Two to three hundred dollar investment sometimes if you wanted to recruit. Did you, cold do, market. Did you do that? I did that. Because did it all work? right, here's what successful people are doing. Do what successful people do. So I invested in products, I put an ad in the paper, I um hooked up a phone, I did all the things that successful people were doing, and then I went to the training. And this was one of his trainings he did that was four times a year, and so it was one of the most expensive ones, one of the best trainings. So I mean, I look into that in terms of, of you know, I was maybe seven, eight grand in, nine grand in from day one. So I couldn't afford to, I couldn't afford to fail. Does that make sense? I guess he's on his phone, I don't know what's going on. Are you like doing double, we're having five cameras? Recording now? while five I'm recording. Cameras. <laughs> so I put my, I think so many people are afraid, and I wouldn't be here today, Cody, if I didn't put myself in a situation where I couldn't afford to fail. Mm. I've already, I invested too much into this already to not learn how to do it successfully. And I wasn't successful right off the bat, but I think, there's such a low barrier of entry these days in any opportunity. It's so easy to quit. Why do we never want to put ourselves in that spot? Like nobody wants to put themselves in a spot where they can't afford not to fail. Oh, because that's how we're taught, man. We can we could be here for the next hour talking about our educational system if you want. Kindergarten to 12th grade, 14,000 hours, learning math, science, English, history, over and over and over and over and over again. When did they ever teach you about putting yourself into a corner and building a business? How many hours did you have? I mean, like seriously, how many hours did you have on how to raise, how to raise children? 
How many hours? 14,000 hours in school. How many hours did they spend on how to raise kids? Yeah, zero, zero hours. Zero hours. Now, would you say that's a small part of your life when you get married and have a family or a all-consuming, all-encompassing part of your life? It's not small. Yeah. So would you would you say it was a all-encompassing? Would you agree? Yes. I mean, when you have children, you people live for their kids, right? So like, how <laughs> would you rather learn that or what a dangling participle is? Like, I could care less. Like, what's a dangling participle? Like, <laughs> Parallelograms? Oh, parallelograms yeah. or the square root of pi, you know? It's like, I asked that one time, what's square root of pi? They're like, 3.14. I'm like, no, that is pi, but that's okay. We're, we got a long way to work here. So <clears throat> in school, we are conditioned. I mean, I, I really believe this. You know, I, I think that school teachers are the most overpaid, <clears throat> uh, underpaid, yeah, right. Overworked, yeah, I wish, right? Over, <laughs> overworked, underpaid individuals on our planet. God bless them. They have our children from the, the, the when their their brain is the most malleable from their youngest age, eight hours a day, and they barely can pay them enough to survive. But yet, you know, some guy can catch a ball and run in four seconds a certain number of distance, and they pay him a ten million dollar bonus for it. Gary V yeah. talks a lot about that too. Well, yeah, Gary V does. Yeah, and he also talks about how people try and limit their kids with screen time, and he's like, I want my kids to have as much screen time as they can. What world do you think they're growing up in? Like, get them to understand the internet, get them to use the tools that we have, and you know, it's an interesting time we live in, man. And things are changing. What's I want to learn about the Civil War? I go Google it now. It's different. Like, you know, so our kids are locked in these things, learning all this stuff that's irrelevant. Why not take a child who loves music? Like, most kids hate learning, and you know what sucks is when you get out of school. Guess what? In order to have success, you have did you have to learn your business? Did you have to learn about leads? Did you have to learn about marketing? Did you have to learn about how you're an expert now? Yeah, oh yeah. And see, now most kids hate learning. They hate it. They don't, they just, because learning is attached to, oh my God, I gotta do something I hate. Why well, if I took a kid who loves music, why don't you put him in an accelerated music program where they get to play music all day and get to study about the music and get the, like why not? But they don't do it. Well, that's what I love about insurance right now too is because we have friends that are 22 year old dudes. I'm sure you have plenty of people on your team yeah. that are young guys that are dropping out of college to go sell insurance. They're learning everything, but they're also making killer money and not racking up a debt. And that's what I think, you know, we, me and Cody always joke around bringing sexy back to the insurance industry because it's like, <laughs> bringing sexy back. well, it's like, we, 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 I, I made sexy over. Sexy back. Was that like a Justin Bieber? Song? I don't even know. I think it's like 98 degrees or something. Marlon would know because <laughs> his favorite is Justin Bieber. So but, Marlon you know, would know it's, it's a, it's a sexy it, back. There's a true opportunity when you get out there and meet people and talk to people and sell, you know, that's, that's where, that's where the, the future is in my opinion. So speaking of mentors, you, you've brought up a mentor multiple times and a lot of people don't know that you're the mentor that Marlon Faulkner talked about. Uh, on the podcast that we did that was one of those you That's know true. content that popped off so you obviously learned some th some things from your mentor that you then passed on to others absolutely how important is mentorship in the insurance industry how how important is mentorship in life okay it's hand down the number one most important how thing. do you go about finding a mentor if you truly want to find a mentor find someone who has what you want okay it's very very if you're taking notes write this down because this is very very simple success is very very simple right i don't know how many guys watching this how many ever cheated before Okay, there were guys not raising their hands. You both are liars and cheaters, right? Because we've all cheated at something, right? And see, in school, again, oh, man, we could, you get a paperback, minus this, minus that, minus this, minus that, minus this, minus that, right? So you're conditioned already. Mistakes are bad. Mistakes are bad. Mistakes are bad. Mistakes are not bad. Mistakes are the only way you learn. But were you ever taught that? I mean, you, we're, we're fighting. I mean, when you go out and try to have success, you're fighting. It's like it's like growing up Baptist like I did and me walking into a room and some guy stands up there and goes, the only way to get to heaven is being Catholic. I would fight. Oh, what? What are you talking about? Because you have years and years of programming. Like, no, I'm right. I got these beliefs. And the funny thing is most of the beliefs that people hold on so tightly to aren't even their own. They got them from their mom, dad. I mean, I'll do trainings where there'll be a thousand people there. How many of the same religion as your parents? <laughs> Then everyone just stop and go, hey, you know what? I'm going to study the Quran. I'm going to study uh, Catholicism. I'm going to study Buddhism, right? Or if that's that, right? or, or, or being a Muslim, what a Muslim's like. Or I'm going to study how to be a Christian. And I'm going to pick what I believe resonates both best with me. No, because, you know, you're, you're Baptist, good or bad or different. That's the way to be it, man. This is the Bible. It's the truth. It's there. You, you're a Muslim. It's, it's, and who's right? Who's wrong? Who am I to judge? Right? But most people's belief and ideas come from other people. So we're very easily brainwashed and we're very conditioned. So we're first of all conditioned that, guess what? Mistakes are bad. And that's the first thing I'll tell you. I was, I'll tell you, mistakes are bad. So we want to have that, you know, fear of like, I don't want to make a mistake. Well, you're going to make a mistake. Anytime you try something new, you're going to suck at it. You just start accepting that. Right. Mm -hmm. But you got to find someone who has what you want, do what they do and watch this, you'll get what they got. So when I was in school, and I sucked at science and I positioned myself perpendicularly right next to the girl who gets straight A's on her science test. 
And I was able to look at her test and fill in the same circles that she did, exactly how she filled them in. And I'd miss one or two, so it didn't look like I cheated. And I get my paper back, and she has 100, and I have a 98. I wasn't like, I got, I got a 98. I'm like, yeah. Duh. She had 100. I put two circles different than she did. I got 98. And see, success <laughs> is that easy. Like, success is that easy. Like, it's that easy. Yeah. It takes work, right? It, 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 but if I find someone who has success in an industry or has been successful at lifting weight, successful at losing weight, successful at doing whatever it is that I want to do, and I just do what they do, whether I believe it or not, agree with it or not, if I do what they do, as long as it's ethical with an integrity, I will get what they got. I mean, GPS on your phone, right? If I plug in a spot on my GPS on my phone that 10,000 other people went there and I just follow it, instead of getting creative, I will wind up exactly where the GPS told me to go. But most people don't do it. Like, they, they start that path. Well, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't like the way how he talks. He comes pretty aggressive. He cries too much. He's too emotional. I totally agree with what you're saying. But I, I do think the insurance industry has a problem with authenticity. I mean, everybody is making more money than they actually are. And they're talking about how much place business they have when really... We it, talked about that. It's ridiculous. So I think that's yeah. part of the challenge. Someone says I'm making 20 grand a month. They made 20 grand once. They make like 12. Or or I made 20 grand one time, and now I extrapolate that times 12. So, so I got charged back. So here's, I make 240 grand a year now. You know what I'm saying? Because I made 20 grand 16 months ago. And it's like I, I just I stuck with that I used to talk narrative. the same way, by the way, years ago. Well, nobody knows that, but but there's no doubt. It's just ridiculous. I think everybody does it like, and, at some point, you know, and then you just kind of like. All of our, and, and by the way, if you still And I'm do new this, in the insurance industry, so I always tell him I'm the dumbest insurance guy you ever meet. Like, I, I know nothing about insurance. Someone asked me a question, and I'm like, uh, I don't know. That's another thing. People think that, I don't mean to cut you off, but people think that you got to know all this stuff to know it. You just got to know people. And you got to just work hard. Good grief. Work ethic just takes you so long, <laughs> like so, so far. That's it. It's just you see more people, you call more people, you win. Come on. But I mean, if you're, if you're one of those people that is like talking about how much money you make and it's just way less than what you actually are, just, just we're all laughing at you. Yeah. Stop doing it. That's true. Yeah, we I, all I, know what's going on. I agree. You know what I mean? It's <clears> easy <throat> to sniff that out. Plus, I don't, want to, I don't want anyone to know how much money I'm making. They'll come try to rob me. So you know, we're good there. It's like, uh, well, just tell them. But it, it was no. <laughs> we we won't give them your address or anything. <clears throat> no, we're good. We so, won't tell them your full name. He's so funny. What it was funny because I, when I first met him, right? I won't go through the whole backstory how I met him right now, but um, unless you want me to. But I. Uh, Do you want people we were, to, get, to get, guess in comments at your, in, your annual income or, or no, no? I don't. Okay. So when I met him, we were talking on the phone. I said, "What? What do you feel like um, the biggest?" And I don't know if he remembers this. What, what, what do you think the biggest missing piece is in, in, in uh, the insurance business? Like, why insurance? I said, don't answer yet, right? Because we're going we're to email each other back or forth or answer on the phone at the same time. And we both said the same exact thing. Me they you. don't see enough people. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Number That's and I, I didn't know that answer. He didn't know that answer. I was going to say the answer. They don't see enough people. Because, I mean, it's hard to say this because if you're failing, you're going to hate me. It's rocket science. Right. You're going you're to hate me if I say this, but, like, I could tie a note around a dog's neck if it was cute and send it into 10 people's home and he'll come back with three policies just because the people want it. Like, it, it's just, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm serious, right? So if you don't offend the person, there's three out of 10 that want a policy. If That's you sit funny. with 10 people, there's two, you know, maybe two, three. I mean, I do it on a daily basis. I did it for six years and I go into it and there was just, it was always like two to three or if sometimes four. It didn't matter what I said, they want to sign up and the reason they called you over or filled out a letter or filled out a fine or answered a Facebook ad is because you have an insurance license, and if they knew where to get it, they would have already gotten it. Yeah. And they wouldn't fill something. That's the thing. We can go on that, that tangent there about leads. They wouldn't have filled something out if they didn't have a need for it. Mm. So if they fill a card out or a need, that's another thing my mentor taught me and learned in network marketing. Don't buy their BS, so to speak. You know, They did it for a reason. They weren't bored, right? And I know there's some different... Yeah, ambiguous yeah. things that happen, but they did it for a reason. They're so like yeah, yeah. now they're now they're on human um <clears throat> how we are programmed method. Don't want to be sold to. I'm not interested. I'm just looking. You know, I hear it all the time, like, you know, oh, I'm yeah. just looking. You go to a store, what happens? Dude, you I'm, walk in, right? Yep. What do you say? How can I and help? you're in sales, right? I go, no, I'm just looking. Just look just shopping. But you know you're looking for something. You just walk in there. It's like people go to a car lot. Like, can you imagine the car? Oh, I'm just looking. Oh, yeah, you packed your family up on a Saturday afternoon just to drive onto a car lot because you were bored. You just had a brand new car yesterday. You just wanted to just see if there's anything else out. Come on. Yeah. 
they express interest. There's a need and you yep. got to figure out, get past their knee-jerk reactions and just, again, knowing human beings and find out what that need is and find out if you can solve that need. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you sit there, it doesn't make sense for them. So with your with your your team, how do you get them to overcome the just the pure work ethic it takes to sit with more people? Like, what do you? What's your angle? How do you get people motivated to do that? Because that's really what I find is one of the challenges with team builders like yourself is getting the team to actually take the time to do the work ethic to get in front of the people. Yeah, because that's that is that is you would think it's so easy and so simple. I remember my first year. I'm like, if I just sit down with more people than anybody else in the office, I'll probably make more money. You know, but it doesn't seem to like click with people, or we're just innately lazy or something. <laughs> you're you're asking me this. We're going to talk about this. No, I'm asking. <laughs> I'm asking what you do to motivate your team to get. I mean, it, that that what your statement is is true and simple, but the work ethic that it takes to actually sit with ten people is not easy to do. So, what do you do to motivate your team, or how do you motivate your team, or what do you you know what's the right? Strength? And that's a good question. The, I, we glazed over. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a second. We glazed over the. Uh, I think not glazed over. But we back to the mentor thing. So what is the answer? You 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 pose the problem out there. What's the answer to that? How do they find a mentor in the insurance industry? It's not full of hot air. It's hard. So what would you guys suggest? They probably want to know, right? What would I suggest to find a mentor? Yeah, because you said it's like, hey, that's you know, it's easy to find a mentor to do what they do with have they have. But I didn't say it's easy. How do you know? I would I would just meet with a bunch of people and just see who was full of crap and probably run from for the hills for those guys that seem to be full of crap. I think it's ask also, for transparency. Yeah, it's also easy to to to, to seek out too many people. You That's where I was going to go. Yeah. Really confused <clears throat> when you've got forty two people online all saying different things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so a struggle. Key. So key. It's a struggle for me. So key. That's why I end up listening to Cardone more than anybody else because. I listen to Gary V. He's going to tell me that I don't have to do things I don't like to do when I know I, you know, I, I don't want to pick up the phone. Like naturally, nobody likes yeah. to actually make yeah. calls. Yeah. yeah. So you should, Gary V said I don't have to, but I kind of need to. You know. There's a lot of noise. That's why I said the noise. Dude. So it's like, and and here's what I always say. I don't think anyone's right, and I don't think anyone's wrong. Because if they had success, what they do works for them on what they did to have success. So like, if I want to have a McDonald's. And I tell my guys this all the time. We have we have a system. It doesn't have to be perfect. Do you think either one of you guys could go in the backyard home tonight and cook a hamburger better than McDonald's? Probably. I, I could guarantee I could. Can you make a hamburger better than McDonald's? Maybe. I'm you not as good of a griller your as wife, you two. Your wife <laughs> could though, right? It doesn't take much work, right? I probably could. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Are, are you selling billions? Mm -mm. No. So whether it's McDonald's or Subway or Burger King or In-N-Out Burger, they all have their own system, right? But I was in Ireland, great, greatest trip, you know, as insurance carriers are sending all these trips. So I'm in Ireland and we're on the cobblestone streets in Dublin. I mean, it was just like, ah. I never got to travel. I made a lot of money, but I was always married to my business. I could never travel. So like in the insurance industry, it's cool. These carriers, if you actually do what you're supposed to do, they send you on trip after trip after trip after trip, yep. right? And maybe that's not so attractive now with the coronavirus, but you know, <laughs> it is when it's not out there, right? Um, and, you know, we went to London and we went to, uh, you know, Russia and Estonia and Finland and Kauai and Maui. And they put you up in like the Ritz Carlton. It's almost like all the insurance carriers try to outdo the other ones. So it's kind of cool because yeah. you're the beneficiary. That's right. That's right. <laughs> We're going to the Ritz Carlton in, in Kauai. All right. We're going to the Ritz Carlton Reserve. Only two in the world in Puerto Rico. We're going to Costa Rica. So we've been traveling the world based upon just doing what we're supposed to do. And I'm down in, down in Ireland and... Um, we're just, I'm with my wife and we're holding hands, we're walking. It's like, oh, this is beautiful. It's one of my first trips ever out of the country in Europe. She had been the year before and I haven't. And there we are just soaking it in, man. There's a pub, you know, and the music. And you just feel like you're in a movie, right? Mm -hmm. And then we turn the corner. There it is. Starbucks and a big old yellow Mickey D sign. And I'm like, oh. It almost like pulls you out of the moment. Totally right? ruined it. Totally ruined it. And guess what color those arches were? Guess what color they were? They were in, they were in Ireland. They, were, they weren't green. Yellow. <laughs> they were yellow. Yeah. So you don't have to have the perfect system. It's just if you find a mentor or someone you want to follow and listen to, then don't try to read. You, you can't bring in Subways. Well, I like the way a Subway does it. So we're going to have all the patties at my McDonald's and all the beef and the burgers, and they're going to be able to top their own burger. That's not how McDonald's works. They take this thing they call onions, which I don't really know what they are. They're all chopped up and they throw them on the bun, two pickles, squirt of ketchup, squirt of mustard, bun on top. It feels like it was, you know, freezer burned seven times. They shoot it out. And would you like to have fries with that? That's their system. 
right? But it doesn't mean that subway system doesn't work. Yeah. So what happens is it's hard, it's difficult because there's so much noise here. Like, well, I love the way McDonald's does this, but instead of putting it under the heat lamp, what if I did this? And what if I did that? And if you're first starting off, you're going to kill yourself. So I always said, find a system that you resonate with, find a mentor you resonate with, and do their system exactly to a T. This is what I did when I got involved in my company. Exactly what they tell you to do until you're out producing them. Then add your own spice. Mm, so I was good. in my company for five, four months, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be the number one uh, eight, I didn't add any of my own spice. The script they gave me, I used verbatim. The thing they said to say in the home, I used verbatim. It wasn't until I started putting my own little chocolate icing or sprinkles on the cupcake that they did, and I still use that system. It wasn't until I was actually at a point where I was at where the top producers were and out producing the top producers before I ever even started to even add any of my own spice. What's insane is the amount of money you produced your first month in the business. <laughs> what do you want to talk about money? Well, <laughs> people want to hear about, hear about it. How much did you write your first month? Fifty over fifty thousand dollars in annual premium volume. First month in the insurance industry. I've never heard anyone say that. I'm sure there are people that do that all. Day. I know, but they haven't sat there. <laughs> How'd you do it? Following the system they laid out and just and, work just, and just working working ethic. But I mean, again, 20, 20 year overnight success. So I knew people. <laughs> Right? Yeah. So I worked in the credit card processing industry. So I did network marketing. I waited tables. I worked in, you know, different, I worked in the mortgage industry for a very short period of time. I was in a cubicle for about, if you know me, I was in a cubicle for about four days. I said, this ain't going to work. Yeah. Right? I couldn't do it. So I told the guy, I said, do I have to come to the office? Because you have to be here at 10. You can leave at seven. You can barely sit there the whole time. For I, an hour. I know. I know. And, and, and I told him, I said, can I, if you let me work from home, this is so funny. I said, if you let me work from home, I guarantee I can be, I'll be one of your top guys. If you let me come in the office when I please and when I don't. And he goes, okay, great. And they paid you, I answered an ad and it was a, in between a network marketing <laughs> business that the company collapsed or whatever case may be. And I answered an ad and it said, you have to have a minimum of two years experience in the mortgage industry for hiring. Cause it was a, a big, big uh, mortgage company. And I walked in there to the interview. First question they had, how much experience do you have? I said, I don't have any experience. Yeah. You know, so do you want a guy that has experience, going to sit here and you're going to go through 10 of them to find the right one that has the drive and the passion and, and one of them to learn and stuff? Or do you want somebody that's going to be, will it be a sponge and learn and be able to duplicate what it is that you're teaching, follow your system and go out and be your top producer? If you had to pick, which would you pick? Well, again, learn from my mentor, Trapdoor A, Trapdoor B, make him pick. He said, I'd rather have that person. I said, well, I'm your guy. He hired me on the spot. I said, okay, great. I'm going to do zero sales the first month. And he goes, what? I said, I'm doing zero sales the first month. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. I might need to I'm paying you 2000 a month draw. What do you mean you're going to do this zero sales? I said, because who's your top guy? The guy's name was Mike. And I go, who's your top guy? He was Mike. How much does he do? Oh, he, he does like 16 mortgages a month. <laughs> like your refinances. Okay. I said, I need to sit by him for a month. And I said, you have to prove it with him. I went to Mike and said, do you have to sit down with me for a month? And every day, I had a yellow pad and paper. I watched how he made his calls. I watched how he sent his packets out. I watched how he got his packets back. And I next month I sat, he was here, and I got the cubicle here. Why? Because there's no way I'm gonna remember everything I just learned for a month. So I want to have him earshot, ear distance as a mentor, and he didn't make any money on me. And that month I came in just one shy, first month in the mortgage industry. First month. Second month, because the first month I did nothing. I I out of the whole entire office, out of the 32 people that were there, I was one deal behind him. Mm. So you built Second. that foundation. You spent the month to build the foundation. Yeah. So like, and don't, now everyone's going to go, oh, I can't get started yet. So I have a month of stuff. But that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But hey, thank like, you for clarifying. Yeah. yeah. Very, yeah don't, that's not hard. I got started right away in the insurance industry, right? But I took the information they had and, and, and you know, I did mortgage protection. Number one, not final expense. You know, so when I started learning, that's how I met you. I wanted to try to get final expense leads, found your leads online. And then I studied his videos. Why? Because... He was the top, you know, he went out and made $117,000 and 13 cents, whatever it was, you know the number. That's right. His first year part-time while he's playing basketball in college. Well, if a guy can go out and do that, if one man or woman can do it, so can I. If a thousand are doing it, what's my problem? So I figured, okay, great. How do you do it? Watch his videos. Watch the five benefits close. Watch how I did on the phone. Watch his cold calling videos. And it's like, if I'm going to do mortgage, people, oh, well, I, I, I didn't know how to do final expense. I don't care how much money I make. I can make a bazillion dollars. And if I never sold final expense, I got to learn from somebody who did it. Why try to do it my way? That's right. I, 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 why not follow someone who's done it the right way? So I just, I just took the system they provided, right? So I watched, took their script and I listened to their audios and I said, who's your top guy? And I listened to what they said and asked some questions. And then because I had the foundation of knowing people, 
I mean, the credit card processing business was tough for me. You know, I mean, I, there's no leads. We were cold called, knocking on doors, and there was forty to sixty thousand competitive companies that were out there trying to get our yeah. business. I feel sorry for that industry. It's tough. Yeah, and I was able to make millions of dollars based on what my mentor taught me in that industry. True. Same thing, people, right? People and work ethic. So like this, I mean, I got involved in this business. I was like, okay, you're telling me they like initiated a response that they want it? Like they mailed a letter in more traction, They mailed a letter back in? <laughs> no, no, come on, come on. I could buy my own production. I mean, like I could. I, I have no limit of how many people I can buy to talk to. And they told you that they, I mean, man, we walk into a, a restaurant, oh, I'm here talking to Visa, man. Oh, I'm all set, just took care of that, I just switched, I'm in a contract, they, they pay to get out of their contract, pay to get in our contract, upgrade their POS. I mean, there was a lot of moving parts there. I mean, it was like, you had to overcome like 17 objections just to get them to give you their credit card statements so you could review it. And I'm talking to someone who doesn't have the coverage, I'm not really competing with anybody, and they mailed a letter and say, please call me. So like, it was all a perspective, right? It's all relevant. So when I saw that, I'm like going, okay, as long, this is like federally regulated. I have a license to do this. Like, there's gotta be a catch. And I went out and wrote $15,000 in business my first week. I mean, I talked to people. I mean, I knew about knee jerk reactions, but my brain kept saying, okay, they got junk mail or they're perusing on Facebook or whatever, right? They see a letter, it's junk mail. They pull it out. They go, hey, honey, look, we can potentially protect our family case with that. They grab a pen. They fill it out, put their name, their phone number, they whatever it is, best time to call. They take an envelope, they put it in the envelope, they lick the envelope, put a stamp on it in some cases, and they walk their butt down to the mailbox, flip the little red flag up, and put it in there. I mean, if that ain't buyer intent, I don't know what is if you're talking about marketing. I agree. Or if they're face they're 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 cruising online, whatever it is, they 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 so like when I got that letter, I didn't nothing they said threw me off my game. Right? Oh, we're not interested. Okay, great. I won't go through all the objection stuff, but it's like, I was like, they are interested. They put it, I, I visualized that in my mind, like they're interested, mm. right? And people said they weren't interested. I went and helped them with the policy anyway. It's just that I knew that that human brain does that knee jerk reaction. So to answer your question, we, I, we wrote a 50,000, 50,000 APV my first month and 85,000 in six weeks. 85,000 in six weeks. And when you say 50,000, we're talking 53,000. It was like, I don't know. You know, know I like my pennies. Number. It's fit. I'd have to look into my opt software. <laughs> Eighty-five exactly k in is. six months. No, six six weeks. Six yeah. weeks. And it yeah, was in, even freaking. Yeah, even crazy. And it was funny because it was in it was in December. It was in November, December of two thousand thirteen. And and I was told that's one of the worst times to sell insurance. And I was taught by my mentor find out what everyone's doing, do the exact opposite. Because I said, well, if everyone's taking their break and they're on vacation, they're sleeping. I have a chance to get farther ahead. Wow. Because now, hey, everyone, I have. If you're running. And you're running against people, you run at the same pace and you're trying to run a little bit faster and they all of a sudden take a nap, pfft, done. So we did that and I started recruiting and, and then we had an agency that was doing over $100,000 a month within, uh, within four or five months. How many, you sold a lot and you recruited a lot of people. Right. How many in, 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 in your first few months or whatever? Um, we had 69, and these were all unlicensed agents. 90% 90, 90 of them were unlicensed agents. We had 69 uh, licensed agents within our first 60 days in our organization. But it came back to where I came from, recruiting, promoting. So, okay, so a, 85K in your first six weeks. Yep. And at the same time, recruited 69 people in your first 60 days. Yeah. I had 30 people, 30 people in licensing before I got my license. It's unheard of. I don't know about it. No, I mean, I, whether you agree or not, it's unheard of. It, it, I doubt it's ever happened before. Well, can I ask a marketing question? Yeah. How much did you spend on leads and marketing for that eighty-five grand in six weeks? Well, what's That's funny is, is that we ran into that problem because I didn't know. And there's, I was told by the upline, which I didn't listen to this part, that it's not working like what I'm used to in the past, and that there's a little bit of ramp up time because back then there was, you know they had to mail out to these areas. So I'm recruiting people like I was taught how to recruit people through the people that they know in the warm market and who do you know? Because we always find the best quality people, um, usually three or four levels people in. And that's what people do. Like, I'm not recruiting my mom and dad. I'm not trying to recruit my mom and dad. I want to know who they know that maybe they know somebody who may have an interest in doing that or dissatisfied in their life. And I know we're doing a... Um, webinar tonight. Webinar tonight, right. On, on how to recruit 69 people in, in 60 the, days. And that's the problem with our industry. We got a lot of people that have bought it. You did it. You recruited 69 people in 60 days. We're doing it together. It's 69 freaking dollars. You're giving it all away. And still, most people won't 
pay for it. <laughs> and see, I used to bother me, but I, I, you're right. but, but I, that used to bother me. But like, uh, you know, it's really cool. I, I actually I like that because it's like I I Dude, I, I love it. I, I mean, I just yeah. spent twenty five grand to sit down with Grant Cardone for two days. Like, yeah, no one else will do that. I just bought a course on SEO just to Dude. see if I didn't know anything, and I looked at it and I'm like, I mean, you got to invest in yourself. Dude. Good grief, right? You know what I mean? And I know oh. I know SEO, but so but I got I bought the course anyways so I could see if I can learn something. You know what I'm saying? The minute we think we know everything about marketing, oh boy, someone else does. Well, they say ego is the most expensive thing that you own. Ooh, it is. And I had one. You know, I had to get beat out of me a little bit. We all have one. Wow. And the health ego is good, but you know, ego is the most expensive. I don't know who says it. Somebody says it. It's not me. I didn't come up with that. It's the most expensive thing that we own. Just put it in quotes and get, put put Nate's yeah, name put on TM it. Yeah, put TM and Nate off it, right? <laughs> That's why if I say something, I'm just going to write my own book. It's going to be the NIV version, the Nate International version, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so what I, again, I asked what were the average guys spending in leads, but I probably spent $500 to $750 a week on leads. And you did that much business off of 50, it? 50000 APV, first month, yeah. So like within within Two sixty days, grand. within and what I love about the insurance business is within sixty days I had over forty thousand dollars deposited in my bank account <laughs> from the carriers, and that was back when we had paper apps. Oh my god! So you really this only is, spent like four or five grand on marketing. Yeah, I mean that it wasn't that much. That's awesome. It's amazing. Well, I was going to be less impressed if you're like, I spent 60 grand on marketing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I was going to be like, true. okay. Well, I, I would try to, I, I, I wanted to sit down with, and that's another thing. You know, I, I have an audio I do for my guys because you're going to ask, I'm, I'm coming back around to this motivation part, right? Because he asked that question. I haven't forgotten mm-hmm. about it. I just sometimes float off see a little some squirrels. bit. See some right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Squirrel! <laughs> that from that show, that's, yeah, right? yeah. That's me too. Sometimes I can be, I kind of get off on, on on the tangent and flow. I'm not a bullet point type of guy. Like I try to use PowerPoints and it doesn't ever work out. Yeah. Because I'm like on slide 32 and then it's like I'm showing slide one. <laughs> it's supposed to be like progression. I, I My brain just doesn't go that way. Um, <laughs> but I did this audio car, called the, the, the farmer versus the hunter, right? And I talk about whether you're a hunter or a gatherer versus planting the seed and, and being consistent. And most people want the hunter and the gatherer, you know, whether you eat meat or whether you gather vegetables, so we have to be politically correct. It's usually the hunter versus the farmer I came up with, but we'll just say hunter and gatherer because it might be a vegetarian. I don't hunt. But that's like that, you know, the leaderboards and, you know, doing 30,000 one month and then do five the next month or sit down and doing 22 apps in a week and then not doing an app for like the next six months. It's just like going... What, what I found in any success is you gotta have that consistency, right? So if you're a farmer and you have to dig the hole and plant the seed to have a tree grow, to have the harvest, I can guarantee you one thing, you're never gonna have a tree grow out of a hole where a seed was never planted. Would you agree with that? Yes. So like in the, in the, in the insurance business, it's you know set the appointment, dig the hole, sit with the appointment, plant the seed, and then you have your harvest. Yep. And there's chargebacks, locusts, there's rain, there's droughts, but out of your control, out of your control. Yep. And people all of a sudden stop planting the seeds. Oh, why there is a drought. I'm not going to plant a seed or there's a, there was a big rain. I'm not going to plant. That's the time you plant more seeds. Right? So like to me, all I, all I did is, is figure out I have to, if I sit with a certain amount of people, no matter what, if I sit with a certain amount of people, I'll get the production that I need. Control what you can control. And my number was eight to nine people. If I could sit down in front of eight to nine people a week, I could write 40 to $50,000 consistently. I think the most a ever- month? Yes. From eight to nine people mm-hmm. a week mm-hmm. sitting with. Jeez. Yep. You're a good salesman. So no, I wasn't good at salesman. I, that's, yeah, but you're closing most of them though. Well, well, I went. Yeah, I, I had. I was. I went in one stretch for twelve weeks with a hundred percent close ratio in the home. I walked out every home I went into. I walked out with an app. Then I realized that it wasn't good because you don't want to walk out of an app because I had some chargebacks and stuff. And certain people that you just sometimes you don't really need. Whatever it. though, you sold them all. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I didn't sell. That's the thing. All I did because I learned. You know, and these are some things that you know. I, we teach to our organization with our SWAT trainings that we do that you're at. And these are yeah. things I'm going to start wanting to start going out there and teaching to people because it changed my life. But I probably, because people ask me, what's your presentation like everything else? I mean, my presentation was probably less than five minutes long. All I had to do was go in there and find out what was their need, right? Why am I at their house? What, what is it that I can help them do by asking them questions? Find out what's on their TV screen. We talked about it in your sales meeting this morning, right? right. What, I'm not going to go through it all, but what's on their TV screen? What are they watching? My mentor taught me that. Like, what are they watching on their TV screen? And how do I get them to watch what I want them to watch? 
And if I can create a realization in their mind that they need what I have, they'll buy whatever it is that I'm selling. So all I did was do the same thing my mentor taught me for years and years is I was able to paint a picture in their mind, made them live their life without this product, and then made them live their life with this product. By telling stories? Asking questions, telling stories, and then making them answer the questions. If I were here today, Lauren and Cody died yesterday, you know, whether it be mortgage protection or whatever, what would, <clears throat> what would that look like for you, right? How would that play out financially? Well, it'd be tough. When you say tough, what's tough mean? And now she's living, no one ever sits down, like even in the insurance I never sat down with my wife and lived my life with like, what happens if I die? We don't wanna think about it, we don't wanna talk about it. So like for the first time in your life, you have husband and wife, and there's times where they'll cry, they'll, if you get emotional, right? Because I always share why I do this business and everything else, and we don't have to go through all that today. And I'll have them live their life and they'll talk about it. And it's amazing what they'll talk about. It's like, well, what, what, what would I do? Well, what would happen, you know, would you have to sell the house? I mean, would she? Which probably, is that what you want to do? Well, no. Okay. What would happen, Cody, if Lauren, you know, wasn't there? Maybe they have kids. And I just have them walk them through it. Right. And I go, okay, great. So if Cody passed away and obviously emotionally it'd be a tragedy, but you received a check to pay for this entire house and three years of replacement of his income. Would that help? Would that do something for you? Well, yeah, that'd help a lot. Well, what would, what would that accomplish in you? What would that accomplish with it? And then she, they tell me, they spend the money. Well, I'd be able to do this. I'd be able to do that. I would want to carry on his business. So I would try to, you know, put, you know, landing in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, but it, I so, run straight to the ground. Right. So when you have, yeah. when you create, so now I just created a realization in their mind, but they, they just lived the movie without having this, and then it became real. True, it became real. So whether you're selling final expenses, like okay, great, when you pass away, and your family has to come up with the burden of twenty, thirty thousand dollars to bury you, what's that look like? How how old are your children? Do they have kids? Do you think it's going to put a financial stress on them? I mean, do you really want, I mean, I, I think I'm sitting here because the last thing you probably want is, is your lasting legacy to be one of, oh my God, mom died and we spent the next six months struggling financially to make sure we could put her in the ground and appreciate her with a funeral. I'm sure that's not what you want, is it? Right? So whatever it is, when you create that realization, there's no sale because their human brain goes, my God, I need this. I've noticed you always end with a question too. Always. What do you teach, man? Over and over and over and over and over. It's weird how you sell fifty grand in a week, and you're always in. Even when not we a talk, week, not a week, not a week. I'm a sorry, month. Month. <laughs> even, even, <laughs> that's sorry, oh, sorry, so sorry. Nate offers sells fifty grand a week. Well, well, Here we go. The Here we go. There we go. No, yeah, that, that you, the title. I've noticed even week. hanging out with you on like a personal level, you do, do a lot, that a lot. You end with questions, you know. So it's good. It's just ingrained in you. It is ingrained, All right? Just doing it over and over and over, and over again. Cool, right? Well, well, I mean, if you if you had an opportunity where you knew if you ask questions and always ask questions to people, and it would result in making millions of dollars, it'd You'd be ingrained in you too, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I There's mean, another question I asked them. <laughs> it is. It's just ingrained in me. Well, and you also don't put people in situations where you wouldn't say yes. You know what I mean? Like you're. I've noticed that as well. Well, he tries them. He 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 calls them trial agreements. I always thought they're called minor minor agreements. Yeah. And if you can stack up seven minor agreements on the eighth time, or ninth time, or tenth time when you go and ask the the question. They're so used to, I mean, we're so primitive as human beings, right? And yeah. and the problem is, is that people sometimes learn this. I think it's manipulation. And it's like, well, if you use it the wrong way, it is manipulation. And manipulation yeah. is not even a bad word when it comes down to the actual root word. It's having influence over. And there's a positive manipulation. So if I can manipulate your brain, who according to Thinking Row Rich says that the average person contemplates to consider, to evaluate, to discuss before they can ever make a decision, and I can manipulate your brain to make a decision that's in your favor so your family's not picking up the pieces and going in debt or doing doing a GoFundMe account or having to beg people at church or their neighbors or have to sell something in order to bury them. And I can manipulate your brain to have that positive effect. Mm -hmm. See, I'm in this business because there is a sales guy who didn't know this stuff who sat down with my best friend who I didn't have a brother. And I worked with him in the credit card processing business. And this guy tried to sell them. And we were working in the credit card business together. I was single, living the dream, you know, as a bachelor. He was um, married with three three kids. And um, 
his wife just quit her job to have her third child. And I get a phone call. I just met my wife. It was one of the happiest times of my life. I just met my wife. I'm like, this is the woman I'm going to marry. And I get a phone call at 6 a.m. in the morning, and Manny's on the phone and said, Corey's gone. I said, he'll be back. He loves you, man. He, he loves the girls and everything else. She goes, I don't think you understand. Corey's dead. I'm like, he's 34 years old. I'm like, he's dead? When he, and it was, how is he dead? Hmm. And she said, he was out fishing with his buddies last night because he was into catfishing and stuff. They do that in Nebraska, I guess, and it was cold out and had the waders and everything on. And the boat caught fire and, and she was hysterically just crying, right? And, and the boat caught fire and he jumped out and he tried to swim the shore and never made it. And she said, Nate, he was so happy because he just reached a level of success in his life where he's finally getting to enjoy his life. I just got to quit my job and they're dragging the lake for his body. And I, I, this is before I was in insurance and I said, did you, do you have any type of life insurance? And she said, yeah, I just sat with some, down with someone a week ago. And I was like, well, thank God. And two weeks later, different conversation. And here, here's, here's a, they were they're college or high school sweethearts, wonderful family. They loved each other dearly. And her last memory was Corey left us with nothing. Nay, he left us with nothing. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. You know, and I used to show a picture to people, you know, because he had this picture that we sit on the couch with the three girls and it said, uh, it was so sad because it says, my hero has come, his name is daddy. You have a daughter, imagine that, right? And they're all looking up at him and then you know, now he's gone. And I watched that just ruin her life. You know, lost a house, had to get out of the house, no money, no job. And so I look at that and it's like, what if that guy because I knew my friend very well. He tried to sell him. You know, he never signed the papers. So she thought he had insurance. And he said, you need to think about it. Mm. And so I look at that and I go, what if that guy had that skill? What if that guy had the ability to help my friend Corey not feel sold, but to make a decision that was the best interest in his family? Because he wasn't able to manipulate him to put... An, his signature to an application, if that's the word you want to use, it significantly had a direct negative impact on his entire family because he didn't have insurance. So when I got asked to consult for the company I work with now, not the actual company, but I, I tell the story how I got kind of drug into it against my will, but I got went out there, it was my third, it was my third appointment and I'm sitting there in a home and I didn't even think about, I didn't make the connection. It was like a year or so ago you know, after the fact. So I wasn't connecting life insurance and what happened to him and everything else. And I was sitting in a home um, and there was a wife and um, husband there. Sorry, <laughs> it's a crazy moment. But And three daughters running around. And I said, well. Let me tell you a story. No, I, I said, yeah, what? If something happened to you, what would that look like? And she had a tear come down her side and said, I'd be, I'd be screwed. And she, something happened. One of the girls ran around and she called her name and one of the, the girl's name was the same name as my friend. And I'm like, is this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Mm. And I know it's going to sound bizarre. It's going to sound crazy. And I had the video because I played it at my training. I immediately thought of Corey and I went down and Googled it. And the first, I tried to reduplicate this a hundred times. It's still on the YouTube. People can find it. And I Googled his name and his wife's name. And the first video has popped up is Mandy telling her story about what happened to her husband for another insurance company, telling the story of why it's so important to have insurance put in place. And that was kind of that moment that I felt like I'm in the right place. Like how many lives could I help teaching them the things that I learned from my mentor to help navigate people to help make a decision that they know is in the best interest. How many Corey's families can I help? Yeah. 
And that was became my mission. That was why I get out of bed so early. Well, I don't get as early as you and Marlon do, but why I get out of bed so early in the morning or why I, I, I'll work hard and why I stay on the phone because at the ultimate, is there a lot of money creating the most millions? Great, but at the very end of the day, we're impacting that's a heavy load to wear. We're, every day we yeah. wake up, we're impacting whether you're selling a lead, whether you're buying a lead, or whether you're meeting, you're having a negative or a positive impact. You can't pick. Once you sign up, you're in a church day. That individual you're responsible for, and, you're, and you can't fix stupid. I'm not saying you can do that, but you're having an impact, either a positive or negative way on that human being. Mm. So how hard do you want to study your craft? Do I just want to go through the numbers? Which is good just to help people, or do I really want to learn how to connect to people? Do I really want to learn how to ask the right questions so I can help them make the decision they already made when they clicked on the banner ad or when they clicked on the lead or when they mailed the form back in or they put called in the IVR number or called the postcard. They already made the decision they wanted. It's My great. job as a professional is learn the skills necessary to make sure I can help them continue to reinforce the decision they already made so their family's protected. Does that story with your friend impact how you sell today and how, cause nobody likes to leave a home where someone's thinking about it and I'll call you back and all those things. You probably, and whatever word anybody wants to use, like you said, you probably push harder because of that. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I'll even, I'll even share that story in the home. I tell them why I'm here. I, I'm a big, I'm a big advocate of sharing your why before you expect, how can you become, then become vulnerable if you don't become vulnerable mm. and everyone has a why it doesn't have to be that why, yeah. you know, but everyone knows somebody, excuse me, I don't know, the right. picking my nose on camera here and stuff. Um, <laughs> and it's still a raw emotion for me. Right. Um, but it, it's, you gotta have, and everyone has a story like that or they know someone has a story like that. You know what I I'm saying? And, and that's all I do in the home is ask questions and tell stories, ask questions, tell stories. You know, if I'm talking about critical illness or, or critical, you know, uh, heart attack, stroke, and cancer, I'm telling story, story, story. Does it amaze you that 92% actually do fail? Of what? <laughs> of insurance agents. 92% fail no, it in their first three years. But but the way you talk about it, and I'll jump in while you're blowing your nose. I, I, <laughs> Thanks. The way you talk about it. 85k in your you know 50k in your first month 85k in your first six weeks recruit 69 in 60 days but everyone else is freaking fell in this deal it's just well i mean i was in the credit card processing business and and uh <clears throat> it's funny because um i i signed up a gym right and i signed up a gym uh where they you know do gym memberships and i would do like an ach program where they, they take the ach's out and stuff like that and what was amazing to me was that I looked at his, how many people he was drafting each month. And I'm like going, I'm like, how in the world do you, do you fit all those people? This is how dumb I was, right? How in the world do you fit all those people in your gym? <laughs> and he started laughing. He goes, what do you mean? And like, you have like 5,000 square foot gym or 10,000 square foot gym, not that huge, right? And he had like 2,700 people that were getting drafted every month. And he just laughed because they, they don't all come to the gym. He's like, I yeah. wouldn't be able to fit them. He's like, yeah. you know, the majority come at the beginning of the year, right? And they're all hyped up and they're super excited and they're stoked. And he's like, back around April, May, it dribbles down to where we may have gotten five or six more new steady comers. Gotcha. You know, and then because they make the New Year's resolution and everything else. He said spring picks back up a little bit before the summer because they all want to gain their weight and they'll make all these resolutions. He's like, we may pick up one or two more regulars. Sheesh. And it just goes on. It's the same cycle. So with 90, 92%, that's actually 92% is better than what the statistics talk about in Think and Grow Rich. You know, he said only 3% will achieve financial independence in their life. So, you know, nine, yeah, 97% are going to retire on families, friend, family, friends, and the federal government, you know, will be their retirement. So, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not shocked 92% of people fail um, <clears throat> in the insurance industry because, Majority of people fail at most of the things that they try to put their their set their mind to do. And it's like you you, you know you you talk about the numbers game um, as not being the whole thing, but you also have a system that's tied to you know the numbers are the system, but it's not the how you sell and the personality and the story and all that. Right. Right. So you've got the system, you've got the story. How would you encourage somebody that maybe doesn't have that story to become a storyteller? You know what I mean? Like, what do you, do you feel like stories are needed to sell? Oh yeah, you use other people's stories. Okay. I mean, as a, people use my story all the time with my friend. You know, 
I got involved. I mean, I have a good friend of mine who's in, in this business, my business partner. You know, if I'm working with my team, they're my business partners. They're a good friend of mine. I use people's stories all the time. I say, collect stories. Collect stories and, and you don't make up stories. That's the big <laughs> difference. Don't make up stories, right? But yeah, collect stories. Yeah, that's called lying, which a lot of people, people do. People could tell too. Oh, yeah. I Like the way you told that, there's no way it's false. Right. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a story that is dear to me that happened. That's true. Right. And people may, I hate people make up stories. It drives me yeah. nuts. It's like, why, why? You're, you're lying. You're, yeah. You're, you're not being authentic. That's when you're manipulating. That is you're extreme not, manipulation. Yeah, not you're not being authentic. authentic. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're, see what about human people, people, <laughs> nice people like nice people. My mentor said this to me too. Right. And he said, and mean people like nice people too. Right. So if you're just authentic, people are, people are attracted to authenticity. Like they, people like you because you're authentic. So be authentic. And like people go, Oh, I have to do that to sell. No, that's how I'm authentic in my way. There's people that are authentic in their way. And if you're authentic, I mean, that's 90% of the battle is just being you and just connecting with that person, that human spirit that they know you're a normal guy or a normal person. Right on. You know, I mean, it's I like, agree. I'm in Texas. Find a mentor. And that's, I mean, that's a core value of yours, right? Yeah. Authenticity. Integrity, authenticity. You've said it over and over since we've hung it out. I'm just yeah. who I am, man. I'll be honest. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'll tell I'm you what you... Gonna, yeah. I'm not going to slow it down. I'm not going to you know, speed it up for just for you guys. I am who I am. You'll, you'll get, you get the true Nate, man. It's like you, you may love it. You may hate the it. The real Nate offer. That's why, <laughs> that's why I've always enjoyed getting around you, though, seriously. From the very beginning, you know. It's just, that's just how you are. Yeah, no, I, I just say how it is. I mean, it gets me in trouble a lot, but, you know. And we haven't even released you. If they get to this end of the, the end of this podcast, hopefully you did. Because if you didn't, you missed a bunch of good stuff. Uh, this dude's speaking at eight percent. We haven't released you yet, and we're re- actually releasing you like next Friday. But that's why authentic came from nothing and is making a lot more money than ever, most people I know. Recruited sixty-nine people in sixty days in a new industry. Stupid. <laughs> Wrote four fifty k in thirty days in a new industry. That's stupid. And 85K in your first six weeks. That's why you're speaking at A Nation 2020. And I can't take credit for any of it, but I can definitely pass along the information that I had got taught by mentors again in my life and one, one specifically that, that, that changed my life. So That's why I'm excited to hear you get up there and deliver a keynote. This dude. This, you can bring it. This dude. <laughs> I've seen your videos, man. He's a way, <laughs> way better keynote stage speaker than me. I've learned a oh, ton, I don't know ton from that. watching you. Oh, it's true. I don't know if you believe it or not. I don't know what is certainty. A, what is a keynote anyway? I don't know what a keynote is. Well, we'll find out at eight percent. Well, I guess I, I don't know. And we, they might not get. What are you talking about? Eight percent. What are you talking about? Eight percent. I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I wish that I could just talk to you guys and ask you what you want me to talk about because, yeah. like this, this is me. Like I walk well, in here and, dude, and I can't. I don't prepare. I can't prepare. I just want to talk from the heart. You know, you know? what they want to know? No. Oh. They want to know your story. There you go. And how you did it. That's the key. Yeah. And you've laid out some, some, a lot of stuff that most people will never be able to do. Like follow a system that someone else does, you know, like that's too difficult. We also set the record for the longest podcast we've shot. That's true too. Yeah. Which means no one's going to watch it. (laughs) No, but you know what? Most people, you know, never be able to achieve what you achieved because you just did the steps and, and you know. You did them in order. It's you know. It's weird. And see, ninety-two percent of the people, ninety-two percent of the people, won't watch it till the end. That's exactly right too. <laughs> but the eight percent who do may learn something. But That's we'll, right. we'll turn on Spotify and listen to you know some music. That's you know exactly I mean? right. That's exactly right. So yeah. You know. Well, I appreciate you joining us, Nate. No, I, I appreciate you guys having me here. I mean, you you guys, um, and for those that are watching, it's like you know I. I always says my, my, my wife has this like heightened sense of smell, right? Like, we, what's that? You know, we, our, we had a fire in our home, uh, not the home we have now, but a couple years ago, and, and we're going to bed, and she's like, it smells like something electrical. I'm like, babe, I don't smell anything. I go from room to room to room to room to room. Sure enough, we wake up in the morning, beep, beep, beep. House is on fire. Sheesh. Squirrels chewed a, um electrical cord in the, in the rafters wow. on the corner of our house, and the arc... You know, it was arcing back and forth, I guess, whatever they call that. I'm not an electrician. And caught the fire. <laughs> I, I, I love God because he likes to humble you. 
in, in the closet where my wife's wedding dress was, all my tailored suits were, my first Rolex watch was, my all my earthly prized possessions, my alligator shoes, my 4,000, you know, all, all this stuff is so important. Gone. In a minute, gone. I mean, that's, that's humbling, right? You know, it's like, okay. So and, she, and, and so she has this heightened smell, right? But so like, I feel like I had this heightened meter to, to detect authenticity, which I do. And, you know, I've gotten to meet you um, and I've gotten to uh, be around you a little bit, but just being able to hang out with you guys on the level I've been able to hang out, you know, some people say I get up and I write my goals and, and, <laughs> I look in the room, he's writing his goals. Some people say they get up at six in the morning to go to work out and he's gone at six. Trust me, I was up at 5.38, I got the video to prove it. I'm like, I'm in Cody Askin's house, just seeing if he's up at 6 a.m. <laughs> you know, go I, I got on a video, you yeah. Know, did you know going to the gym? Yeah, yeah he went to the gym. That, he, that's that's you, probably late. Well, I didn't go work out with my trainer across town. Oh, okay, okay. It, it's, I went yeah, so he was probably getting up late. by the house to come right? back. So I've never, like, I've never been up at 5.30 in the morning in my life unless I was, like, forced to with a gun to my head. So, like, I don't suggest it to anyone, you know. I know all you miracle morning people. Hey, I'm here to tell you, you can go to bed at 2 and get up at 7 and still make millions of dollars. You're okay. <laughs> Taking hot showers. You're good, right? So, anyway, I said, hey, when in Rome, Just do what the Romans do. all my do, stuff. Right? When in Rome, do what Romans do. So I got up and I... Uh, had my little thing. I even <laughs> looked at the microwave. Said five thirty-eight in the morning, stalking it out. So, but in what, what I love about both of you guys is hanging out with you is that you're you're you you're truly authentic in who you are. You you say what you say. You do what you do, um, and and you're not a bunch of hype. We try not to be. Well, yeah. I mean, well, we're none of us are perfect. You know, I get accused of being hypey, but you know, it's just my per personality here. So, but people ask myself too if I'm on drugs. <laughs> so, so I want, to, I want to thank you and for the people that are that are that are watching that may know who they are or, or don't know who they are or wonder if they're really too good to be true. Um, now, don't screw me over and like you know, just my word here. But no, for, from my 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 uh, standpoint, getting to hang out with you, that you, you guys are the real deal, which is awesome because I'm driving in here today and I asked Cody what what. It was a shocking answer, but it wasn't shocking coming from him. I said, "What?" Well, and I'll end with this. But what? What is your favorite thing about what you do, right? And he said, "My favorite thing about what I do is when I get a a comment or a phone call or a text that an agent says." His example was, "I was about to quit. I found you online. I've been watching your stuff. Thank you because you gave me the knowledge and the wisdom, and the power to keep moving forward." Because that's my favorite part. And I, I think that's, I don't think, I know that when people's real motive is to, for impact and that's what they're striving for, those are the ones that have the biggest impact on people as opposed to people who pretend they want to have impact so they can make a bunch of money because eventually it's exposed. So <clears throat> you guys are phenomenal uh, and I appreciate having an opportunity to come out and be a, a part of it because what you guys are doing has never been done before and you're, you're a disruptor in this industry and very few, if any, if none, um, have a heart that you have, Cody, and a, and a staff. I mean, like, I didn't know you had this big operation, man. My God, employees everywhere, sales team, you know, get intimidated a little bit, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, like, you you are making ways and, and you're bringing people together and you've had an impact in my life on just the, the people you've introduced me through through your network and stuff. So I'm, I'm appreciative and I'm great, grateful for being on. So You know, you know thanks, what's funny, guys. too, about this guy? Is every time we we meet with high level like insurance dudes, they always look at them and they're like, "You can make so much more money selling insurance. Like, why don't you just like build this big insurance company, or whatever?" And he's like, "Dude, my heart is helping insurance succeed and training and helping people. Like, I know I could. You know what I'm saying? That's but this true. is what I'm doing. This is my focus. So yeah, which money, is awesome. Yeah, his money's where his heart is, man. You, you you can always say you can tell a man's heart follow his pocketbook. Yep. So mm. there you go. Anyways, thanks, well, thanks for joining guys. Us. Yeah, thank, appreciate thank you for joining us. Thank appreciate you, you very much. Thanks awesome for joining job. us on this podcast for this marathon podcast. Uh, it was great. All right. We'll see you guys in the next one. Hey, if you love this interview, unbelievable interview. I talked about the power of events, and you guys know that I love events. I want to share everything I learned at Grant Cardone's 10X Growth Conference event. It's right there. Click on that video, and I'll see you there. So I can either learn by failing and having to learn from my own experience, or I could just pay. Mm -hmm. You know, you just did that.